Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Terp Talk. I'm Wayne Viner. That's Todd Carton. This is the Viner Four Gates studio behind us here, all this Maryland memorabilia. We've got Todd over there. Is that is that a UMBC sweatshirt you have on tonight? It is indeed, Wayne. You know, I have to stay true to my school. Well, I, I take you as a Terp, but I know that you actually are a retriever at heart. So speaking of things that are close to your heart, we are going to talk about what's going on with the basketball team. We're going to talk about Maryland, Michigan, but really Maryland being bowl eligible for football. But I want to start with something that Todd actually follows as much as anybody out there, which is Maryland field hockey. He had a chance to go to the final four. It was Virginia. Todd, what happened this weekend? <laughs> That's a really good question, Wayne. You know, I I was in Michigan last week and I saw Maryland uh, play the first game of the Big Ten tournament and I saw pieces of the second game and they played extremely well, losing in double overtime to Northwestern in the championship game. Northwestern going in as the number two overall seed and having only lost one game all year. And they played very, very well in the NCAA tournament opener against St. Joseph's kind of dominated that game. And I thought, wow, this is a team that's peaking at the right time. They had a rematch against Virginia, whom they had beaten down in Charlottesville earlier in the year, two to one. Uh, I don't remember how close that game actually was. It was a while ago. So, uh, you know, I felt fairly confident going into, into that game. And Maryland came out uh, flatter than Kansas. They, they really were, were dominated from the beginning of the gift, from the jump. Virginia looked motivated. They played hard. Maryland played sloppily and played poorly, kind of reminiscent of the game they played, the final game of the year they played against Northwestern that might have gotten them a Big Ten championship. And it's the first time in or three or four years that Maryland won't be making the final four. Well. Usually in sports, if you get close to the final four, it's been a good year. But I know that the women's lacrosse and the field hockey team, if you're not in the final four playing for the national championship, you, it wasn't as good a year as you had hoped. That's true, Wayne. And, you know, I know that uh, Missy, I've talked to her casually about this. She's, you know, a bit frustrated. She hasn't won a national championship since I think 2011 or 2012 was the last one. And I know that she she felt like she had a, a team that was capable of doing that this year. Team was a bit inconsistent, and they had a couple of really bad games. And unfortunately, they picked a really bad day to have one of those bad games. All right. Well, thanks for that report. And like I said, I know this one's close to your heart, and you really stick with that team. And, well, we'll get them next year. We'll get so them next here's year. a bit of what I'm going to say is really sad and 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 bad news. And usually we don't get into these topics, but Special K, Keith Moore, the guy that used to run out there in front of the football team with that cape and the signs, on Saturday afternoon, he passed away. I have known him for, just counting back, 38 years, I believe. I met him on South Hill on campus when he was, decided to get a few guys to come out and try and convince Brian Williams, who played center for the basketball team, to not transfer to Arizona. Brian Williams later became Bison DeLay, played for the Detroit Pistons. And we were not able to convince Brian Williams not to transfer. And that's where I met somebody who I think is as big or probably a bigger fan than I am. And his number one sport was Maryland football. And he's been on the field for 20 plus years. And I saw him, saw many bad football games with <laughs> Special K. And I spoke to him every week. And I really ad admire the perseverance and the energy he brought to Maryland football. And not surprisingly, he is, was a motivational speaker. He spent many years with AT&T. He had his own motivational speaking company. And is a was a very compelling, passionate Maryland fan. and. He will be missed. Uh, I spoke to his son tonight, and I'm not going to get into details, uh, but he took ill. He has been missing from the football field 
in College Park as Keith for the whole season, and he passed away. And the, the one note, I probably write something about this, is his son said that, that he held on until Maryland won that game. And when they became bowl eligible, he, he went ahead and took his, uh, his heavenly reward at that point. So um, hopefully somebody could say that about me one of these days that I, I'm hung around until Maryland made that bowl game. And, and that was enough <laughs> for me. Well, so, he'll, he'll certainly be, he'll certainly be someone that uh, we all miss. And I noticed his absence and today I didn't have the pleasure of, of having really ever interacted with him, but uh, anyone who could suffer through as many bad years of Maryland football as Keith did and still bring the level of energy uh, certainly deserves a lot of respect and our admiration and condolences to his uh, surviving family members. They're, they're planning and the memorial service. And when we get that information, we will do our best to get it out to you. And we hope Maryland football, I, I understand they're already in the works of putting something together for the game on Saturday to commemorate Special K. Now, that, that's the bad news, but the, the good side, the thing that made my weekend uh, somewhat positive is Maryland actually is bowl eligible. And I'm talking about a program and, and I have been as disappointed as anyone because I believed that this team could elevate. And I believed that two bowl games was, you know, if Locke said we're going to play for the Big Ten championship, well, he must know what he's talking about. And over the past few weeks in the loss to Illinois, losing at Northwestern, the mighty, mighty struggle against Nebraska just to win the game. It's not the world's greatest football team. And all those guys that left and went to the NFL, and we've talked about this in the postgame shows, had an impact because they didn't replace two NFL cornerbacks. They didn't replace three NFL-level linemen. And they didn't replace C.J. Dupree, who's blocking for Alabama now at tight end. Just the two wide receivers went to the NFL, didn't really replace those. So, sure, it's not the greatest team. But over the last 19 games, Maryland is 14 and 5. You know, that's Wayne, not bad. That's not bad. And uh, particularly given the fact that Maryland is playing in the Big Ten East, which, if not being the toughest conference in college football, is certainly in the top two. And one thing you, you have to take note of, and I know, it, yes, I think we all at, the, at this point felt that Maryland would be. Uh, eight and two going into this game. Um, but looking at, frankly at, at Northwestern and, and Illinois, they're both five and five. So the losses are not quite as devastating as, as we thought or projected at the beginning of the year. And we also have to keep in mind, this is only the fifth time in program history that Maryland will have become or made bowl, a bowl game for three or more, three consecutive years or more. Uh, there was a stretch in the 80s where they made six straight, uh, but but three or more years, three years in a row. It's only the fifth time in the entire history of Maryland football. And yes, I know there are a lot more bowl games than there were 40 or 50 years ago. So the bar's not quite as high. But still, I mean, even going back to this decade, it's only happened tw or this century. That's only happened twice. Look, eventually you have to say this is Maryland football. This is not Maryland lacrosse. This is not field hockey. It's it's not women's lacrosse. It's not even basketball. This is Maryland football. And a few years ago, there were serious voices talking about whether or not Maryland should have a football team. And it was impossible to win here. If you take away the fact that we thought they could play for a Big Ten championship, which apparently was a pipe dream, and just look at the program as you just did, this is somewhat of a miracle. I, I really don't care who you play because they've played the same or lesser quality opponents for the past 40, 50 years, and they cannot put that many streaks like this together. So there were years where they would have found a way to lose to Virginia or lose to Charlotte, lose one or two more games, and they'd struggle the end as a 5-7 and seven team, but that didn't happen. They won the sixth game, and I don't care. It was a mess. And I've talked about when they played Penn State or Ohio State or maybe Michigan, maybe the other team will have eight turnovers today and Maryland can win. Well, Nebraska had five turnovers and Maryland needed all of them. And Maryland won at Nebraska. 
And if you'd wind the clock back and say Maryland went to Lincoln, Nebraska and won a football game, that's actually pretty big. That's a pretty big check mark for Maryland to go on the road. You mentioned okay. the West, and then I'll throw it back to you. Unfortunately, Maryland's one and two against the West. Uh, so it didn't, didn't work out Maryland's way. Back to you, Todd. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it didn't work out Maryland's way. But as I said, I think at the beginning of the year, everyone projected Nebraska and Northwestern to be not just at the bottom of the West, but at the bottom of the 14-team league, number one. Number two, you know, I, I think we, we may have underestimated Matt Rule a little bit. He's a real program builder. And he's he's done that wherever he's gone, and he's turned things around very quickly wherever he's gone, and he's apparently accomplishing much the same thing at at Nebraska. You know, I mean, as as Coach Loxley said in in the post game in the locker room, it doesn't have to be pretty. The only thing that matters is that the tick mark goes in the left hand column, and you ended the game with more points than the other guy. That's usually how this works. Uh, I've had enough moral victories that I need an actual scoreboard victory. The Michigan game, if Maryland loses by 30 or 40, that's okay. I don't want to go out on the home record with another loss like this, but Michigan looks legitimately really good. I am hoping that just by winning a game and proving that this whole thing didn't fail, that Maryland did get to a bowl game, did get the sixth win. It'll take some of the pressure off, and Maryland might play a little looser and, and see some offense come back. But my goodness, Michigan's good. Yeah, they they are. Um, they are, you know, number one, number two, uh, where depending on where you're looking, and uh, you know, it's going to be an enormous challenge. I we don't know as we record this whether. Uh, Coach Harbaugh will be on the sidelines or not. Uh, I, what, what the status of that is, we don't need to get into that discussion. Does, then to me, football-wise, apparently matters. it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it matters. I think the talent gap is is pretty wide. And, you know, we talked at the beginning of the year, the biggest one of the biggest issues that Maryland was going to have was depth on their offensive line. And once Maryland started having some issues, some injury issues, and had to shuffle guys around and bring some other guys in, that's really when things kind of ground to a halt for the Terrapins. It did, and and no help this year is coming. So there's a lot of freshmen going to be on this team next year who are offensive line recruits. Heard they're going to flip a guy who's supposed to go to Michigan State, who's going to come in, who's a couple of legit guys coming our way. But they're going to be 18 and 19 years old, and they have to go up against the 24-year-old kids from, this time, Oregon and and USC, et, et cetera. And, and, and guys who have had years, three, two, three, four years in a college weight room that right. they haven't had. So this this isn't going to go away unless Maryland gets hot in the transfer portal. But... Once again, I haven't been the most positive over the past few weeks standing on the field having expected to win. And right there's the issue. I expected Maryland to win. And it didn't happen. And they didn't play to the standard that Loxley talks about. But they stopped the losing. They managed to win a game that I thought with a few minutes left, they were done. And this time, Leah marches down the field and Maryland kicks the game winning field goal. And everybody has to go home happy. So with that, I'll turn to the next bit of unhappiness. <laughs> Maryland basketball team was bad. It, it's not that they were lacking. Uh, they go to Asheville and play basically two, for Maryland, two pretty bad games and lose uh, what everybody had also marked as, hey, these are going to be wins. You're going to Asheville to win. And look what happened. It, it, UAB on Sunday was 0-2 at that point. And both games, to me, looked a lot like NCAA tournament games for a Big Ten team. Go out, and and Davidson has a lot of guys who can handle and shoot, doesn't matter, positionless basketball. And UAB doesn't really have centers and power forward, just positionless basketball. And when you match that up against our Big Ten-style offense and, and defense, Juju couldn't guard anybody. Dante Scott looked completely lost trying to guard a, what you probably would say, a kid, a, a young man you're probably going to see playing at the YMCA somewhere three years from now, 
who's a six foot three guard forward, and we just could not catch up to these people. It completely discombobulated us. I wouldn't be shocked if this Maryland team playing in the Big Ten against sizable people will be fine. But they're not really good against these positionless guys. I know you didn't watch every minute of this, but you've seen a lot of Big Ten teams go down in the tournament to to unexpected foes like this. Yeah, I, I can't. I, I'm going to have to paraphrase this because I don't remember it exactly. But but someone someone put out a tweet along the lines of uh, the Big Ten must think it's March already. Exactly. <laughs> Twice. Or, or so, some, something like that, which, which is so so your point is is really valid. And, you know, one of the things that I really looked at very closely was the end of the Davidson game it was tied score. Maryland needs one defensive stop, should get the ball back with potentially a chance to set to win the game or at worst it goes into overtime. And. I was absolutely astonished. You mentioned Dante Scott, and I hate to pick on one player, but you mentioned him looking lost uh, defensively, I guess, both games. And on the final play, he was totally lost. And it just, honestly, Wayne, it baffles me when I see a guy who is a senior and we have a quarterback on our football team who was also a graduate senior make plays that are just kind of incomprehensible within the context of a game. And when I talk about Leah, I'm talking about the pass at the end of the first half of the Ohio State game, which might have been partially responsible for turning Maryland's season around. You know, and it's just a it's just a play that you wonder what's going through the player's mind when he makes that. And it's the same thing I had feeling I had watching Dante calling for switches and then not getting out on the on the shooter. And when he shouldn't even have been calling for a switch to begin with. And it's just baffling that a player with that level of experience would make that sort of a mistake. And from all the games and all the coaching and and playing and so on, in both cases, I think I see somebody saying, I can win this. Instead of, I'm going to do the job I'm supposed to do, say, I am going to win this in the wrong time with the wrong skill set. So Dante slides inside, hoping the guy's going to drive, he's going to block the shot, and oh no, the guy's supposed to cover, leaks to the edge and hits a three. And you know, well, in the Big Ten, that guard crashes through three people trying to make the layup. He's in the right spot. In this game, they just flip it out to somebody else who knocks down a three. It's just a different style of basketball. And we have now apparently fully bought into playing and looking like a Big Ten team. So well, with we'll, that, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> we will see how that goes. So we did want to keep this one brief. And as usual, we're, we're over our segment time. And we're going to thank Rick Jacklich, the big dog himself, um, who has steadfastly stood behind these programs to make sure that our fans, the people who watch this, get good Maryland content. And he, Rick is going to be on with Bruce again in a week to review where we are with both basketball and football after the Michigan game. And, of course, Viner Forgates, your hometown Terrapin IT team. If you need to align your business plan with your IT plan to make sure you're successful, call Viner Forgates, 301-251-2900. Todd, thanks for checking in. Wayne, always a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you uh, Saturday, I think. We will see you after Maryland, Michigan on Saturday. Good evening.